In this video, we're going to talk about different types of computer systems. Um, so, uh, of course, there's hundreds of ways of us classifying different types of computers, but one that may be helpful to keep in mind and, and really kind of emphasize to us um, the difference among the systems is looking at how a computer will be used. Most of us, when we talk about computers, we are really talking about what, what is generally classified as personal uh, computers, okay? Um, so per personal computer systems are whether, whether you have a desktop at home and office, a box that sits on top of your um, uh, desk and it's got a display, if it's a laptop that you uh, carry around, or one of the newer tablet forms, uh, where it, um, or uh, even your phone is really a personal computer, it just happened to be customized to be a phone. Um, so uh, from, a, from a design and functionality point of view, it's very similar to a, to, a, to, a, to a personal computer. So as far as the personal computer, those computer systems are concerned, these are personal meaning you own it, it's yours, or you use it most of the time, you configure it to your needs. Um, typically, this, this will have a display of some sort. Um, typically, they will have a mouse or and a keyboard or some simulation of mouse and keyboard where you can enter data and all that. Could be voice, could be other things as we, as we move in there. And then, of course, they will have some box or some place where the processor and memory and all that sits, okay? And, um, and again, the use is individual. And, and when we think, and an average person thinks of a computer system, they are thinking of a personal computer, okay? And, um, and the other one is the servers. Now, the servers, we are the beneficiary of them. But most of the time, as an average person, we don't see the servers, okay? The servers are uh, typically um, sitting in, in a back office or in a, or in a data center someplace. And most of the time, all the interactions, all the inputs and outputs to them are through some sort of a network, um, in a, maybe internet and LAN or... Uh, or, or something like that. Most of the, the most likely, it, if, if, I, if I have a keyboard, the mouse is shared or a display is shared, most of the time you access uh, the information, you put information into them, get information from them, typically through some sort of a networking. Most of these are sitting in typically tens of them, hundreds of them in a single space uh, being managed and uh, they're used for their computing abilities. Uh, with, with the advent of webs and internet, that's grown very much. You may have heard of uh, these huge data centers that Amazon has, and they even sell their uh, computing power under the cloud computing. Uh, by far, Amazon is one of the largest ones. There are some smaller ones, such as One and One, and um, GoDaddy, and uh, host gators and many 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 other ones who have that service or is a large bank or someone who needs to have a huge amount of computing power and they want to have their own so they get their server so the big distinguish distinguishing stuff here is they are typically in a uh, controlled environment people are not carrying um, control environment they typically are shared is not one person using it, an organization, or in the case of Amazon, a world is sharing it. Um, and then uh, they typically have typically have a very high-end processor, or actually high-end many processors. Typically, they're made out of uh, tens or hundreds of processors, large, large, um, memory and storage spaces, and those are the distinguishing factors. Typically, it's nothing very really exciting. There are little big uh, boxes, like a pizza box, stacked on top of each other, or cards in a back plane connected to each other. So those are called servers. Um, and then, of course, the personal computer is the one we all are familiar with. 
Now, both of these put together over time have become probably less than 1% of the computer used, used in the market. Now, if they are the 1%, where is that other 99%? So if these guys are 1%, so where is the 99% of the computers that are in use out there? Those we name them in general as embedded systems. And embedded systems are systems that you never think of them as computer. You think of them as a potentially a dishwasher. Okay, that is a has an embedded computer. So your dishwasher has to keep track of how long, what cycle, you put input into it. Uh, it so so the input is from your keyboard. Uh, the heater has a sensor in there to see how hot the water is. Has a timer to figure out how long it's been washing different things. Um, practically all your car keys, for example, just simple things like a car key. Is really a computer system, a small computer, but a computer system nonetheless. Um, for example, if most of the cars have a braking system, which is called ABS um, braking system, and that is most likely a computer system that detects uh, spinning of the wheels and slippage of the wheels and adjusts the speed of braking depending on whether the road is slippery or not. And, and you can just kind of imagine what these are. So pretty much, it would it would be really hard to think uh, a of a device that's beyond a very simple, um, like a screwdriver or something. Anything more sophisticated above and beyond that, any tools, anything we use, most likely has a computer of some sort in it. Okay, and um, and so so ninety nine percent of places where people are programming computer, people are designing computer, people are putting computers in, in unit number will be in the embedded system, and that ratio actually is going to be growing toward the embedded system and less toward uh, the larger one, just because a person needs one computer. A person, uh, your desktop computer, maybe two desktop computer. A typical person may have devices, may have 50 devices that are all, um, all uh, um, using um, uh, processors in them, from toothbrush, electronic toothbrush, to cars that may have 20, 30 computers in them to whatever else you're using, a watch or whatever else you're using that has computer system. Even uh, many places, the locking systems in your house, or in, not your house, but most likely if you're working in an office, it's gonna be electronic. So let's go back and review the th type of computer we've talked about is, the one is personal computers. And um, so that's one. That's the one we typically think of when somebody says computer. Servers are just shared devices in a back room. We get, get to them, we get out of them on a networking system, usually large, usually high speed, or thousands of low speed ones put together, smaller computers put together to make a larger one, which is becoming the trend these days. So that, but that then from a number point of view, these are less than 1% of all computers in use. And then 99% are going to be, we're never going to, rec we don't call them computer, we don't recognize them as computer, they're embedded in something else. And, and um, you may also have heard of something called uh, IoT or Internet of Things, which is the concept is because there is, everything has a computer in it, it wouldn't be interesting if these guys could talk to each other. For example, one that very commonly is used, although it's not, haven't quite got to the place where it's useful, is your refrigerator realizes you are out of milk because the milk carton has a chip in it which says when it's out, the, press, the refrigerator knows it, refrigerator can talk to the truck um, delivery from the grocery store and let them know that you need milk and it gets delivered and all of that. So that's an example. Although Internet of Things is used much more heavily in, in the industry industrial environment of making sure of mostly inventory management as, as it goes. Okay, so that's great. So that's what the computer class of computer system classification is. So there's so the processor which goes in the computers uh, has gone through a somewhat of a 
um, revolution or evolution over the years. If you were working in the computer systems in the 1980s, uh, that's really the beginning of widespread common use of computers, the two major processors were Motorola 68000 and Intel. These were the two big competitors at the time, Intel um, um, 80. 86. So Apple products would use Motorola, Intel, process, Intel would be used in Windows systems. Both of these uh, processors at that time had the architecture called CISC, which stands for Complex Instruction Set um, um, Computers. Complex Instruction Set computers Cisc. and the basically the idea was that we're going to throw as many instructions as we can in the hardware so you don't have to implement that was very nice because whatever instruction you wanted was in there uh, sometime in the 90s or so people figured that that might not be the best way of designing computers and starting with people like uh, uh, Sun Microsystem, Sun, oops, Sun Microsystem, they had a product um, which was called RISC, IBM's PowerPC, and a, and a few other ones. They start to introduce this thing called a, I'm sorry, that wasn't a RISC, this was a, a Sun Microsystems was called Spark and PowerPC, they started talking about a different concept, provide the very basic set of functionality and let people use those functionalities to build more complex ones as they need them and they do it in the high assembly language or software, line, software side of things, as opposed to making your hardware more complex by building many, many, many functionality that nobody needs but maybe a small group of people. This whole thing was named reduced instruction set computers and for short risk okay and by by roughly 2010 everybody had converted to risk as the normal way of doing i don't believe there are very many folks left who do CISC at this time and maybe legacy systems basically. So, um, so in here we would have, uh, we would have two camps. Um, so people, uh, we have a camp of uh, the traditional people like Intel which produce the processor. You buy the processor as a chip and you design it. And then a whole group of people who actually don't ever build anything. They just give you the recipe. If you remember earlier, we've talked the digital logic, we've talked about uh, devices. Uh, we use uh, to Verilog to define uh, systems. They basically have written a Verilog for processors that you can give, uh, send it to your favorite um, manufacturing facility and they'll produce the chip for you with whatever you want to add. Those are people, the names are such as ARM processors or um, the other the other one that is uh, has, has a pretty good size market is called MIPS. So sometimes people joke that these are the highest use processor who have never been actually manufactured. In a sense that is true, but what happens is that you get the design from the company in the form of a file, you add your additional functionality to it, then you send it to be manufactured as a chip. So they itself as a pure chip has never been produced. But for example, most of the cell phones nowadays are off of ARM technology, ARM processors. And of course, Intel feeds everybody at this point, both Windows machines as well as the Apple machines. And they're all risk-based, all of these processors that are done today. We actually, in this class, we're gonna use a PIC microchip from micro uh, from microchip the company is called the microchip is this is not a processor uh, is more than a processor processor just is this ability to read instruction and execute them 
Um, and again, by the way, this is also a risk, but this also has additional functionality that we will talk about. So this is called a microcontroller as opposed to microprocessor because of these additional functionality. For example, it has a memory on board. It's able to do an A to D conversion. It has the ability to do pulse width modulations. It has a the parallel to digital converter called UART or USART. And so it has a bunch of things. It's, it's really what you can think about. This is a computer on a chip. It's called the microcontroller. It usually means a chip, my, uh, computer on a chip, usually for small functionality. This one even has a memory. I finally forgot to mention it. Anyway, so that's, um, that's the second part of the different kinds of processors that are available, where they were. They started all as a CISC processor, um, where Motorola was the big one producing for Apple. Intel was a big one producing for, um, in, uh, uh, for Windows machines. Then over time, kind of leading the way more or less was IBM with PowerPC and Sun Micro, moved everybody to RISC and stuff. As a matter of fact, for a long time, Apple was using PowerPC. And then in the 2010 and after, everybody moved over to RISC. I think RISC won this little argument. Intel even moved over there. And then over time, Apple moved to Intel. So pretty much Windows and Apple products use Intel. And then most of the smaller devices or non-Window, non-Apple devices use either ARM or MIPS, which are uh, basically a design specification that you can add your stuff and send it to be produced. In this class, we're going to use a microcontrollers because they have microcontroller has all the functionality in it, and the one we're going to use is called PIC Micro. And uh, uh, we'll talk more about it in later videos, uh, how and what and all of that. That brings us to the end of this video.